What's going on guys? John Alder here from tkinter.com and in this video, we're going to look at segmented buttons for custom Kinter and Python. Alright guys, like I said, in this video, we're going to look at segmented buttons for custom Kinter. But before we get started, if you like this video and want to see more like it, be sure to smash the like button below, subscribe to the channel, give me a thumbs up for the YouTube algorithm. And be sure to grab your totally free PDF copy of my Kinter Widget Quick Reference Guide book. This thing's awesome, over 150 pages with all the Kinter Widget attributes. Grab your free copy today, just head over to tkinter.com forward slash widget dash book, enter your email address and I'll send that right out to you. And while you're there, think about membership in tkinter.com, you get all my Kinter courses, all my future courses for one low price. Use coupon code YouTube, you get 30% off membership if you're interested. Okay, in this video, we're gonna look at the segmented button for custom Kinter. And this is a little bit different, and I don't think there's a widget like this in regular Kinter, but you can see it's just one big button that's segmented and there's different things in it. And we click on each thing, something else happens. So that's what we'll look at in this video. So let's head over to our code. I'm using the Splime Text Editor and the Git Bash Terminal as always. And as always, you can find a link to the code in the pinned comment section below, as well as a link to the playlist with all the other videos in this custom Kinter series. So check that out if you haven't so far. So I've got this file, I'm calling it ctk underscore seg button dot pi. And it's our basic custom Kinter code that we always have. So let's come down here and let's just create a button. So I'm gonna call this my underscore seg underscore button, segmented button. And this is a custom tkinter.ctk segmented button. And we wanna put it in root and we wanna give it some values of something. Now you could just create a Python list right here or you can create a variable calling it whatever you want. So I'm gonna call it my underscore values. And let's come up here and create that list. And I'm just gonna go John, April, and Wes. So here, let's say uh, our button values. And here, let's say create the button. Like every button, we need to give this a command. So I'm gonna call this clicker or something, call it anything you want. Now we don't have this yet, we'll create it in just a second. So let's come down here in my underscore seg underscore button dot pack. Let's give this a pad Y of like 40 to really push it down the screen. Now let's come up here and let's create our function. And so we just wanna define that clicker function. And for now let's pass. Now this is a little bit different than a regular button. Now you don't have to do it this way. I'll show you two different methods, but what you can do to make this a lot easier to use is just pass in a value here. Now this value is gonna be whatever the person clicked on of each of these things. So if they click on John, this value will be John and then we can use this value inside of here when we get to that. So uh, for now, let's just go ahead and save this and run it, make sure this looks okay. Head back over to our terminal. I'm in my ctkinter.com directory and let's run Python ctk underscore seg button. And when we do, we see this button here and it says John April West. Now, one thing you'll notice is none of these are highlighted by default and you probably want it that way. So if we click on John, nothing happens, April West. But if you want one to be like this, highlighted already, sort of selected already by default, we can do that. Let's head back over here and just come down here and let's set default uh, selection. And here we just call my underscore seg underscore button dot set and then just pass in whatever we want. So if we want John, you just type that in like that. Let's go ahead and save this and run it again. And now we see John is selected by default now. You may want that, you may not. This is actually a little tricky because we'll see in just a second when it's selected and you click on it, nothing happens. You have to click something else and then come back and click on it before it sort of activates the command that runs that function that we created. So we'll look at that in just a second, how we can maybe get around that or maybe not. So, okay, that's cool. Now let's see if this thing can actually do something. Let's come down here. Let's create a label. And I'm gonna call this my underscore label. And this is gonna be a custom Kinter dot CTK label. We wanna put it in root. We want the text to equal nothing by default. And let's give this a font of Helvetica and like a size 18, make it nice and big. And then let's my underscore label dot pack this guy. Give it a pad Y to like of 20 to like push it down the screen. So, okay, we've got this label, there's nothing on it, but now we wanna come up here and anytime somebody clicks on our button, we want to change the label. So let's go my underscore label dot configure. And we want to set the text equal to, and let's create an F string and let's say hello. And then whatever they clicked on. So that's going to be our value, right? Remember we passed in this value just by default. This is built to 
pass a value when you click and it's called value and we can sort of capture that in this way. So, okay, let's go ahead and save this and run it again. Now, again, you'll notice John is clicked by default. If I click on this, even a few times, nothing happens. But if I click on April, it says, hello, April down here. If I then go back and click John, it says, hello, John. So that's because, like I said, we set this button set to John. If we take this out, if I comment that out and we run this again, now none of them are selected. But now if I click John, it says, hello, John, right away. I don't have to click off and then back again. I just sort of keep that in mind. So that's using that value that we passed in. You can use the good old fashioned dot get that Kinter usually uses. So we can call my underscore seg underscore button dot get. Now we're calling this by dot get and we can do that, but we still have to pass in the value. You might be tempted to take that out, but you need to keep it in there because this thing by default is sending something. So it's expecting something to be sent here. So you just have to kind of keep that in there, but we don't have to necessarily use it. We can use the dot get method that, I, that we just coded. So here we can say, John, April, Wes, it still works the same. So really just whatever you're comfortable with, you can use this dot get method, but really you have to pass in a value anyway. So I don't know, I just probably would keep using the value. It's easier. That way you won't forget, oh yeah, I have to pass something in here. In fact, we could take this off and see what happens. Let's try this. We could go my underscore seg underscore button dot get. That's a function. If we save this and run it, we can click on something and ah, we get an angry error. It says clicker takes zero positional arguments, but one was given. And that's just because, like I said, this CTK segmented button, when you click it, it sends a value. So we could call this anything we want. We could call it X. And then here we could just call X. It doesn't have to be value, right? We save this and run it. Let's clear the screen. And now we click on April, it says, hello, April. So I like to use the word value just because, you know, <laughs> that's what it is. But really, you could, like I said, name it anything you want. So that's pretty much all there is to this button. Now we can modify this and customize it to look all kinds of different ways. And that's what we'll look at, at the rest of this video. But as far as the functionality goes, uh, this is really all there is to it. And just remember, you can create this list here, or we could just instead have copied this whole thing and pasted it right here, just like that. That works perfectly well too. But for me, that's not very elegant. That's getting a little sloppy and your list may be very long. And so it's just easier to break it off into two things, a variable here, and then just pass it in like that. So very cool, very easy and uh, very useful. So now let's come down here and let's play around with this button. So like everything in custom Kenter, you can customize it in all the normal ways. If you've been watching these videos, you know, most of the ways you can customize this. This button has a couple of curveballs that are different from other widgets and we'll go over those, but We'll just start out by changing the width. Let's change the width to say 300 and the height to say 100. If we save this and run it, these buttons are much bigger now, right? Okay, that's cool. We can change the font to match, right? So if we wanna change this to Helvetica and like size 18, go ahead and save this and run it. And now the text is bigger to sort of go with the bigger button size. So that's cool. Like all of these things, we can change the corner radius. And I'm going to start out by setting it to one to make it very square, right? Very angular. If we save this and run it, you can see now they are very square. Likewise, change this to like 50 or something to make it more curved and rounded. And you see now it's nice and rounded. That's kind of cool. And you'll notice it changes the rounding inside of the selection too, right? When you click it or when you just hover. So that's kind of interesting. Let's go ahead and change this back to, I don't know, three or something. So corner radius, we can change the border width. So let's go border underscore width. And let's set, set that equal to like five or something, just so it's sort of easily identifiable. And you can't really tell until you click it, but now this border right here is thicker you know, the gray right between the, the button and the end of the thing here. So that's your border width. What else can we do? We can change the color. So let's change the FG color of the whole thing. And let's change this to red or something obnoxious. And don't worry, we're going to make this look absolutely hideous by the time we're done. 
But you'll notice now sort of the background color is red. Now it's, this is called FG, which is short for foreground color. Foreground in my mind is usually the front color, but I don't know, this looks like the background color to me, but whatever. That's how you change that color, right? So what else we got? We can change the selected color. So whatever thing is clicked on, what do we want this to be? Let's say green. It's pretty ugly, right? Let's save this and run it. Now, when we click on one of these, boom, it is green. It, the hover color is still changing and we can change that. But uh, when it's selected, that's that color there. Very cool. Speaking of, let's go ahead and change the selected underscore hover underscore color. And we can change this to purple. <laughs> I don't know. And I'm using words here, but like everything in this, you can use your hex color codes, right? If you know those. But uh, words are easy, so we're just going to go ahead and call it purple. So here we go. And when we click this, it's green. But if I hover over it, it's purple. If I hover over these, they're not purple because this is just the selected hover color. So, okay, that's cool. We can change the unselected underscore color. And let's set that equal to what? Say pink. Save this and run it. Whoa. Now the ones that haven't been selected are pink by default. Their hover colors are still different, but ooh, that's something. We can, let's see. Speaking of that, we can change the unselected hover underscore color. And what do we want this to be? So uh, orange, maybe? I don't know, we're running out of colors here. <laughs> Save this, run it. Again, by default, they're pink. If we select one, this selected is purple. But these are orange when you hover them. These are the unselected hover colors. As soon as we click one, the hover color turns to purple. But while they're unselected, the hover color is orange. Right? Uh, what else can we do? We can change the text color. So let's just change text underscore color. And let's set that equal to yellow. That's going to look very nice, I think. Oh, misspelled something. Uh, text. There we go. Save this. Head back over here, clear the screen. Yikes, that is hideous. So now the text color is yellow. <laughs> uh, we can set the state of these. We can enable them and disable. So let's go ahead and set the state to disabled. It's normal by default. And when it's set to disabled, the button won't work at all. all right, so I'm clicking on things, I'm hovering over things, it's like completely dead. Now you'll notice the color of the text has been sort of grayed out when it's disabled, we can change that color as well. So come back over here. And this is going to be the text underscore color underscore disabled. And let's set that equal to, I don't know, blue or something. Save this guy and run it. Likewise, the thing is still disabled, but the text color is this weird, funky, bright blue color. That's pretty bad. I'm clicking like crazy. Nothing's happening. All right. So that's cool. We can, by default, like I said, this state is normal. So I'll just go ahead and set it back. Now, when we run this, the text color goes back to yellow. It's not blue anymore because the button's not been disabled. And of course, it still works and hovers and does all the things. So finally, there's a weird one here that you don't see in a lot of other widgets. It's called dynamic underscore resizing. And what this will do is resize the button based on the size of the text. So by default, it's true. So let's set this to false and let's change our font size to like 58, make the font really big. And if we save this and run it, you can see the words no longer fit on here and the buttons are the size that they are. If I try to resize the app, the buttons stay the same. So that's not great, but you may want that for some reason. By default, this is set to true. And you'll see the difference if we run this while it's true. Well, right off the bat, the buttons have been resized to fit the text. And now if we kind of scrunch them, the buttons kind of change sizes a little bit. It didn't happen before when it was set to false. But basically, the big thing is the text fits on the buttons now and it's dynamically done that automatically. Like I said, that's set to true by default. You don't have to put that on there and it'll just do it. You know, if for some reason you've got a very strict GUI that you don't want changing around, you could change this dynamic resizing to false. I guess there's some instances where you might want that, but for the most part, you're just going to want to leave that alone, leave it to true by default and allow it to resize as it is. So 
Uh, that's the segmented button. Very cool, very useful, kind of neat, a little bit different than your regular Kinter stuff. And that's all there is to it. So that's all for this video. If you liked it, be sure to smash the like button below, subscribe to the channel, give me a thumbs up for the YouTube algorithm, and be sure to grab your totally free PDF copy of my Kinter Widget Quick Reference Guide book. This thing is awesome, over 150 pages with all the Kinter Widget attributes. Grab your free copy today. Just head over to tkinter.com forward slash widget dash book. Enter your email address and I'll send that right out to you. And while you're there, think about membership in tkinter.com and get all my Kinter courses, all my future courses for one low price. Use coupon code YouTube to get 30% off membership if you're interested. My name is John Elder from tkinter.com and I'll see you in the next video.